ago, something really profound happened. Uh, for the first time in human history, we became a predominantly urban species. Today, the number of urban residents on the Earth is expanding by 1.3 million people every single week. And while cities only comprise like 3% of the Earth's surface, we're consuming the vast majority of the global resources. Right around when this shift took place, uh, a couple of us uh, New Yorkers set out to explore the topography of our city, New York City, one of the, the largest and densest cities in the world, uh, in search of, believe it or not, farmland. And we found it in the unlikeliest of places. Our plot of land is an acre atop a pre-war industrial building, seven stories above Northern Boulevard in Long Island City, Queens. Our goal was to create a fiscally sustainable model for urban agriculture, one that was scalable and replicable in cities all over the world. We started by laying down a, a simple green roof infrastructure. And then we craned up about 600 tons of soil up to the roof. And Brooklyn Grange was born, the, the world's largest rooftop farm. This was back in the spring of 2010. And our goal to create this, this fiscally sustainable model for rooftop farming was certainly a big one. Brooklyn Grange is strategically designed to be a triple bottom line business. There are some intrinsic environmental benefits to rooftop farming. First and foremost, we are a giant rainwater catchment. Uh, our green roof system that we use is comprised of a, a simple sandwich of felt and drainage plate uh, topped by about 10 inches of soil. What that does is it basically acts like a giant sponge. It slows the rate at which rainwater drains through those layers and, and hits the sewer system uh, of New York City. Now, why is that important? Well, New York City, like a lot of older cities, has a combined sewer system. What that means is it processes both rainfall and our, our sewage use. Um, this made a lot of sense back when it was designed. Our city was uh, far less densely populated, so people were using that, that sewage system a lot less, taking there were fewer showers being taken, fewer dishes being done, fewer toilets being flushed. Uh, there was also a lot more green space. Because the city was less densely populated, it was less developed. So there was less asphalt concrete surfaces uh, just directing that precipitation directly into our, our stormwater drains. So as we saw the city expand, we really saw this system become insufficient. We've reached a point now in New York City where a tenth of an inch or more of rainfall uh, forces our riverfront, our waterfront, stormwater management plants to vent raw waste directly into our local waterways. It's a huge problem. We manage about a, a million gallons of stormwater per farm per year, uh, a fact of which we're quite proud. We also really cool and clean the air around our buildings. We decrease urban heat island effect, the effect by which all this impervious surface, these, these black tar rooftops, absorb sunlight and then emit that, that heat at night. And we decrease the HVAC needs of the upper floors of the building underneath us, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning needs by, by cooling the upper floors in the summer and essentially acting like a giant quilt in the winter. We also create pollinator pathways, not just for our own honeybees, but for the myriad pollinating species that call New York City's ecosystem their home. We certainly decrease the food miles between farm and plate. A lot of the folks who shop at our on-site markets uh, walk on over from their apartments, pick up their bag of vegetables, and then walk on home, and that food actually never sees uh, transportation by, by engine, which is pretty exciting. And of course we compost. We tap into that 600,000 tons of food waste uh, that New York City uh, dumps in landfills every single year to fertilize our farms. These are all great things, but uh, not worth much at all uh, if your business can't stay afloat. So how do we do that? Well, in order to be profitable, we have to be resilient. A fact that farmers have known for ever. Uh, sometimes you have a really bad year for peppers. So what do you do? Well, you turn those ugly peppers into hot sauce. If you're having a horrible year for tomatoes. It's an important crop for us, tomatoes. Then you might pour some resources into your events program. You might start hosting weddings at the farm. 
You might start offering yoga classes. You might start hosting dinner events. Like anything in the built environment, Brooklyn Grange was built for a specific purpose. We, we wanted to create this fiscally sustainable model for urban agriculture, and we wanted to, to, to grow this fresh, healthy produce for our local community. But just as we build on the built environment, we're always building on our business model. Uh, this, this sort of uh, elasticity is what has allowed us to succeed. We're always adding dimensions. We're not, we're not just a farm, we're an event space, we're a yoga studio, we're a community center, sometimes we're a film set. Uh, in an increasingly competitive market, you have to be polyfunctional. And there is nothing more polyfunctional than farming. For example, all that composting that we do, uh, you know, rescuing refuse and reusing it for uh, soil management purposes, well, comes in handy when you can't afford really expensive organic fertilizers. All the uh, stormwater management that our, our green roof system does, well, that, that helps hydrate our crops. It helps keep our irrigation use down. So um, this sort of polyfunctionality is, is really, really essential to, to what we're doing up on the farm. Our buildings are not just buildings. They are, are polyfunctional pieces of green infrastructure. And uh, we've actually expanded now to a second site, which you see here in, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So we're now comprising over 100,000 square feet of rooftop growing space. And, and that expansion, that, that growth was, if you'll forgive the metaphor, uh, entirely organic, which is to say it was directed by uh, the community. We respond to the demands of the people who support us. And one demand was clear from the very outset, and that was education. From the very first year that we started farming on rooftops, the number of inquiries I got from teachers and youth group organizers and camp counselors who wanted to bring their students up to the farm to see what we were doing was, was tremendous. And it was our very first year that I had a, a class up and I asked them, are you guys learning about food and farming in your classroom? And they said no. And I said, well, I bet you're learning about the environment. And one student, uh, he said, uh, yeah, but that has nothing to do with us. I asked him what do you mean, and he, he gestured somewhere off the roof and said, that's out there. And I said, what do you mean it's out there? And he's a big eye roll, like, come on, lady. And he looked at me and he said, out there, in the country, where there's trees and stuff. Well, trees and stuff, as he's become nicknamed around the farm since then, uh, makes a really important point. I mean, these kids, uh, you know, they, they, they leave for school in the morning, they take their elevator downstairs, they descend into the subway, which they take to their concrete block school, from which they look out at all these other concrete blocks. I mean, what about that says environment? What in these kids' daily lives suggests to them that their behavior has an impact on the larger global ecosystem? So uh, this experience with trees and stuff really, uh, it, it, you know, it, it turned a light bulb on for us, and we realized that um, in the process of creating this fiscally sustainable business, we'd also created in tandem a learning laboratory. And we had the opportunity, we had the responsibility to share this learning laboratory with the youth of New York City. So in 2011, we set out to create uh, an educational nonprofit, which we called City Growers. Um, now, when I joined the team to run City Growers, I initially experienced a lot of the attitudes that uh, Anastasia alluded to. You know, the kids who were visiting the farm were not seeing their lives as having anything to do with environmental issues. Uh, but it went a lot further than that. Um, you know, they tended to view soil as something that was dirty, that needed to be cleaned. Um, insects were only worthy of extermination. Um, you know, worms were completely disgusting and bees were downright terrifying. Um, you know, really few students that visited the farm uh, understood where resources like food and water elect and electricity came from and where they went uh, once we discarded them. Now, today in New York City, uh, almost 40% of children and almost 60% of adults are overweight or obese and one in six New Yorkers has diabetes. Grocery stores are packed with overly processed food that is cheaper than any kind of healthy alternative and addictive to boot. 
Um, you know, and on top of all of this, the dominant system that grows and distributes and discards our food is dumping carbon into the atmosphere. Um, it's poisoning our waterways with synthetic chemicals and fertilizers, and it's destroying entire ecosystems. Um, bees, which are responsible for pollinating 85% of the world's flora, are completely disappearing. Um, now, we are more disconnected from the earth now than we have been in a long time, and it's taking a toll on our health and our environment. Now, the kids that are in school these days are going to inherit all of the problems that our generation has created and perpetuated. It's not all bad news, actually. Um, you know, because these same kids are going to pick up the positive momentum of all of the innovative and inspiring and socially conscious ventures that are happening all over the city. Green roof farms epitomize the potential of polyfunctionality of rooftop spaces. In addition to all of the environmental uh, impacts that they have that Anastasia listed, they're also ideal classrooms. They're learning laboratories for science and math. Um, they provide opportunities for physical activity. Um, they showcase sustainability on a large scale. Uh, green infrastructure in action and, um, you know, really visionary engineering, as you can see you know, from these photos on the farm. Now, in our programs, you know, we teach kids that carrots are the roots of a plant and that peas are seeds, and in fact that every single part of a plant has a different function, um, and they're expressed in all of our favorite vegetables. Um, so up on the farm, kids can dig for worms. Uh, you know, we teach them the dance that bees do to communicate with each other, um, and you know, they're tasting, touching, and smelling plants. Um, kids can plant a seed, they can cultivate that seed until it's ready to harvest. They can eat it on the farm and then compost it right on site. They can take the finished compost and apply it to a new set of crops to grow new food. Um, now the older kids that visit the farm are really inspired by the entrepreneurial aspect of Brooklyn Grange. Um, you know, sometimes we get questions uh, from students who are saying, you know, is that farmer getting paid? And, uh, you know, you can tell there's a lot of future urban farmers in the city by the number of faces that light up when you say yes, they actually are getting paid, um, which is a really great thing. Now, since 2011, City Growers has empowered almost 10,000 students from across the five boroughs, pre-K through community college, public and private school alike, uh, to envision a cleaner and greener future for their city through our farm education programs. But the biggest impact that we've had has been right here in Queens. Um, thanks to the Greening Western Queens Fund, over 2,000 students from Long Island City, Astoria, Woodside, and Sunnyside have been able to participate in our programs free of charge. Um, this fall, uh, many of those students will grow on the farm with us for their fourth season in a row. Um, we also worked with two other nonprofits to launch a partnership program that engaged local students in environmental endeavors in their own community. So these kids were farming the roof and teaching their peers about sustainable urban agriculture during the hottest months of the year. Now, after eight weeks on the farm, all of the students reported eating more vegetables and being willing to, to try new things. Um, all of them who had come into the program thinking that bees were scary and, and something to be feared changed their mind by the end and saw them as really important and worthy of, of protection. All of them were able to explain to others how beneficial green, green roofs were and all of them expressed a really strong desire to see them on their own schools. Farm education gives students a new perspective on urban life. Um, up on the farm, we ask students to envision their city blanketed in green roofs and to imagine the positive impact that would result. You know, cleaner air and water, cooler summers, um, more places to grow and learn. 
And that kind of line of inquiry that City Growers is encouraging in New York City youth is, is really exciting for us to see because it's the exact same line of inquiry that was going through our minds when, when we started this business. Um, you know, asking these questions of uh, why does the environment have to exist only in rural areas? Why do farms have to exist only in rural areas? Why can't farms be in cities? And why do cities have to be only cities? Why can't they also be farmland? And why do farms have to be only farms? Why can't they be part of a housing development, whether co-op or, or public? Why can't they be parts of, of hospitals? And more than anything, what, what they ask us is, why can't they be parts of the schools that these kids attend? So when we hear New York City youth asking these questions of themselves, of their parents, of their educators, of their city, it gives us so much hope. Yeah, we, we see the kids that visit the farm as the, the next green innovators that our city needs. You know, these are the architects and the engineers and the educators and the policy makers, the urban planners, you know. But right now, our focus is on challenging these kids to view the urban environment with an open mind. Now, environmental literacy breeds stewardship. And in turn, this stewardship cultivates advocates. Now these advocates pave the way for the innovators to come in and make real, lasting, positive, measurable change in our city. So we all play a really important part in making this happen. Thank you.